going to start a new unit. Let's see if you can figure out what this unit is about. I've put together a bunch of graphic images here to help you figure it out. So let's think about how do these items relate? What are these pictures of? Well, I have an acorn, I have an apple with seeds, I have a bowling ball, an x-ray, a solar system, a solar calculator, a fluorescent light bulb, a Hoverman sphere, a Geiger counter, it looks like a, an old computer monitor, I've got some nuclear power plants and some math equations. Boy, what does this have to do with? If you guess the atom, you're right. Hopefully by the end of this unit you will understand how all of these items relate to the structure of the atom and the history of the atom. So let's get started right away. This might be a graphic that you've seen something similar to before and that little dot in the center might represent the nucleus of the atom. And then going along the outside, these rings or these orbits are paths the electrons might go in. Now that's getting closer to the modern day model of the atom, but it is not the correct model of the atom. So we'll start going way back and see what the, the, uh, the ancients thought the atom was, and then we'll bring it forward and we'll discuss that as we develop the history of the atom. There's lots of questions that could guide us, I suppose. Um, I'm not going to answer each of these at this point, but let's just, I'll give you a chance to think about them. How do we even know atoms exist? How do we know that electrons, protons, and neutrons exist? What is radiation? Where does it come from? Is radiation safe? Does it even, is it useful? Where does matter come from? How are elements formed? Are all atoms of an element the same? How do we measure atoms if they're so darn small? How do we know what stars are made of? And what's wrong with this picture? Well, by the end of this unit, you should be able to answer each of those questions. On my Google Classroom, I've listed probably a hundred questions for you to think about. And by the end of this unit, you should be able to easily answer each of those questions. We'll break this unit up into three large portions. The first part will be the history of the atom, where we'll deal with these topics. Then we'll deal with, and we'll take a quiz after that. Then we'll do particles of the atom, and we'll take a quiz after this portion. And then we'll deal with light, and then we'll, we'll put all that together and have a separate little quiz over that. So that will be this unit, and then of course we'll add a portion related to nuclear as well. All right. If we go way back to the ancient Greeks, we can learn about the history of the atom. And when I say the history of the atom, what I mean is the idea of the atom, okay? That idea of the atom. And about 2,400 years ago, the Greeks were trying to understand matter. And they classified matter in one of four broad areas. They said all matter is either one of these four elements, earth, air, well, I should say fire, air, earth, and water. This is a little little messed up here. Somehow we got water off of there. Uh, wind should be water. And those were the four elements. Now, they even had symbols for them. This one that pointed down was earth. This one that pointed up was air. This one is fire, still the symbol we use today. And of course, this is water. Now, the name of these philosophers, and they, and they were philosophers, they uh, were, would be the equivalent of what we think of as professors today maybe at a university. Democritus and I don't know how you say his name, I'll say Leucippus. And Democritus gave us the idea of democracy, that you could have representative government. Now his idea would not be what we think of today, and his idea only educated male uh, landowners were able to have an opinion and vote, right? Everyone else did not. Um, but that's where we got our idea of democracy from. Now, generally, at this point, I would pull out a bowling ball and I would say, hey, this represents the model of the, the, the atom to the Greeks. And then I take that bowling ball and I drop it on my desk from about a foot up and it makes a loud banging sound. Then I take a rubber mallet and I hit it as hard as I can and the rubber mallet bounces off the bowling ball and people are kind of giggling like, what is he doing? Then 
I cover up the holes on the bowling ball and I inform you, my students, that I have drilled a hole into this atom looking for a nucleus, looking for protons, neutrons, and electrons. And I have students look inside and sure enough, they can't find any of those things. Because the Greek model had no protons, no electrons, or no neutrons. And it was solid and it was indestructible. The word for that maybe would be indivisible. Like, I didn't say invisible, because you can see atoms, right? As long as there's enough of them. I said indis indivisible, meaning it can't be broken apart. So, Democritus was a philosopher, came up with the idea of democracy, but he also gave us the term atomos, which means indivisible. And that's where the term atom is. It's a, it's a derived term. Now, the Greeks were more intellectual than they were experimenters. They believed if you had to resort to your hands to solve a problem, then you just weren't very smart. So they would come up with mind experiments, right? Like if you were to take a sheet of paper and tear it in half, and then take that sheet and tear it in half, and take that little piece and tear it in half. They said you would be able to do that for a long period of time, but at some point, you would reach a point where you could no longer tear that piece of paper apart. And that point was what they called the atom, right? You'd be at the atom. Now they had no evidence of this. It was merely a thought experiment, okay? Or another way to think about this is if I want to cross a room, I take and I can cover half the distance in each step. In a classroom, it might take you six or seven steps where you initially start with a large distance, you cut that in half, 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 and very quickly you're standing right next to the wall and, and you can ask, am I at the wall? And the answer is no, you're half the distance from the wall. And so philosophically you're either at the wall, and you believe that, or you're not at the wall. And that would have been an argument the Greeks had. They believed in what was called the continuous theory of matter and the discontinuous theory of matter. And again, they had no experiments to support this idea. If you believed in the discontinuous theory of matter, you would believe that you would reach an endpoint, that is, the atom. If you believed in the continuous theory of matter, you could divide forever and ever and ever and get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, today, what do we believe? Hmm. Well, I know that we have atoms. But don't we have protons, neutrons, and electrons? Those are smaller than atoms. And those protons, neutrons, and electrons are made up of quarks, which are even smaller than protons, neutrons, and electrons. So I'm not sure we have an absolute answer, but I would think that we believe in the discontinuous theory of matter. There is an endpoint. Now, do we know what the absolute endpoint is? No. But for us, the atom is the smallest part of matter that retains its property. Once you break it down further into protons, neutrons, and electrons, i.e., if I took an atom from of hydrogen and an atom of carbon, and I could steal an electron from each, hold them behind my back, mix them up, and show them to you, you and I could not tell which electron came from which atom. At that point, they lose their identity. So this was a very early idea of matter. Now there's a quote here, to understand the very large, we must understand the very small. And I kind of like that quote. It's sort of how I teach my class. I, I want you to remember the big ideas. But sometimes in order to do that, we need to do and go in depth a little bit more than just the big ideas. We have to try to understand the underlying principles, some of those smaller details. So this class is about learning the big ideas, but sometimes we'll talk about a lot of the smaller details to help you understand that more fully. All right. Um, this is kind of an interesting, this would be a Democritus's first atomic theory. No, you don't need to write any of this down or know this, but I think it's sort of interesting that this is where the model of the atom came from. So we understand the word atomos means indivisible or Greek for uncuttable. Depending on how you translate that, you'll find different translations. Right? 
And so if you continue to chop up matter, you'll reach this endpoint that they call the atom. And they believe that atoms were indestructible. They believe they were changeable, however, into different forms. They believe there was an infinite number of kinds. So there's an infinite number of elements. We don't believe that. We know that there's a finite amount of matter in the universe and that there's a finite number of elements. They believe that hard substances have rough prickly atoms that stick together. Liquids have round smooth atoms that slide over one another. Smell is caused by atoms interacting with the nose and those rough atoms, well they hurt. Sleep is caused by atoms escaping the brain. Death, too many escaped or didn't return. The heart is the center of anger. The brain is the center of thought and the liver is the seat of desire. Well, that's a pretty messed up theory, isn't it? Right? But that's what they believed, right? I, I found this quote, nothing else, nothing exists but atoms in space. All else is opinion, right? Well, that's Democritus's theory. Let's see how that changed over time. Now, Plato was also a, a Greek philosopher and he was an atomist, meaning he believed in the existence of atoms. And they thought that there were just four elements, right? Not an infinite, but four. And they were earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Now we've already talked about the four element theory, and that fifth thing, ether, is stuff that you can't explain. And they had properties, right? And so all the elements would fit on the little chart, and if you combine fire and air, it would be hot fire and earth dry, earth and water cold, and so on. And so that would be the four element theory. And if it didn't fit in there, it must be ether, something else close to heaven. Now, this is uh, The Thinker by Rodin, famous sculpture. And let's see how those early ideas of matter were actually formed. And they're formed just the way we form ideas today. There's a saying that we might be able to see more and no more because metaphorically we're standing on the shoulders of the people that came before us. Not that they were ignorant, not that they were dumb. They did not have the benefit of 2,000 years of understanding uh, that we now have. Now again, I won't try to pronounce his name, maybe Anaxagoras or something, who knows. Well, he was Greek. He was born 2,500 years ago. And he suggested every substance had its own kinds of seeds that cluster together to make substances. Kind of like atoms are clustering together to make substances. Now that's why I showed a picture of an acorn and an apple. They're both small building blocks and if you plant an acorn, you'll get an oak tree. If you plant an apple seed, you'll get an apple tree. So that's a pretty cool idea that he came up with, trying to figure out that, you know, there probably are different types of atoms and that's why there's different elements. So that's what his contribution was. And then, 10 years later, comes this guy, Empedocles, and he suggests there's only four basic seeds, earth, air, fire, and water, and they combine in different ways. Then comes Democritus. Now, Democritus would have been, you know, maybe a little bit more important thinker at the time, so when he said something, he got a little bit more attention. So he's doing this, you know, 20 years after Empedocles, and he comes up with that word, atom. He called it atomos, but that's what it means. And he believed that matter consisted of these tiny units with space between them. And it's basically what we believe today. And he came up with that over 2,000 years ago. Unfortunately, there was a superstar among philosophers called Aristotle. And Aristotle did not agree with Democritus. And because Aristotle said it was wrong, everybody basically forgot about it for nearly 2,000 years, okay? That's interesting how a few people's ideas are so powerful they outweigh other people's ideas. And so we always have to question in science and look for evidence to support, not just based blindly on the thinkings of one individual. Aristotle, even though he didn't agree with Democritus, added those ideas or qualities of heat, cold, dryness, to, their, uh, to improve what he didn't believe was correct. All right, then through the time of the Greeks, the Romans were, were fighters and gladiators. They were not 
giant thinkers, uh, and then came the Middle Ages, where it was the Dark Ages, which meant basically there wasn't a lot of science happening. Then we come up to Robert Boyle. Robert Boyle uh, said basically, a substance was an element unless it could be broken down to two or more simpler substances. So if you think about the four element theory with air being a, an element, Robert Boyle separated air out and disproved and worked on disproving, well, the phlogiston theory. So if you could disprove the phlogiston theory that air was actually a mixture of oxygen and other substances, then you can disprove the four element theory. So Robert Boyle was a very careful scientist and through careful measurement disproved the four element theory. Now the element, the atomic theory is based on some laws of nature and here they are. The law of conservation of mass. That's one that you're pretty darn familiar with. Mass is neither destroyed nor created during ordinary chemical reactions. Now, I added that last part during ordinary chemical reactions because it turns out mass can actually be destroyed in a nuclear reaction, but I don't want that to confuse you. For us, the law of conservation of mass is mass is neither created nor destroyed, period. The law of definite proportions is one that Joseph Proust came up with, and it basically says that chemical compounds can be formed from the same elements in more than one way. For instance, you can have water form H2O, two hydrogens and one oxygen, but you can also have hydrogen peroxide H2O form, and so you get the same elements in a different ratio. Actually, what I'm describing right there is the next idea the law of multiple proportions, that two or more elements can combine in more than one way. Now the law of definite proportions would state, look, every time you find water, it's H2O. It's never anything else. It's never H2.2O or H1.95O. It's H2O. That's the law of definite proportions. That's an indication that atoms are whole and indivisible and always combine in whole ratios. right? It's kind of like if I said, if the average family has 2.3 children, you know there is no such thing as a 0.3 child, right? There might be children born with birth defects that are missing a limb or something, but they're still a whole child. So this is evidence that, again, mass cannot be destroyed because atoms can't be destroyed. Law of definite proportions, the atoms always combine in whole number ratios because atoms can't be broken apart. Law of multiple proportions, even though these atoms can combine in more than one way, they're always going to be whole number ratios. Again, all of this is evidence that atoms cannot be broken down and are whole. So let's look at this real quick. Here we are looking at conservation of atoms. I have a balanced chemical equation. On the left side of the arrow are my reactants. And this says 2H2 plus O2 goes to two waters. So I have, remember, hydrogen is diatomic. So here's one H2 bonded together. Here's a separate H2 bonded together. So that's two H2s plus an O2 oxygen. Now these atoms rearrange so that I end up with H2O, H2O, two waters. So in a chemical reaction, atoms are rearranged. But if I do my accounting, I started with four hydrogen atoms, one, two, three, four, and two oxygen atoms. And I ended with one, two, three, four hydrogen and two oxygens. So that's good news, that in a chemical reaction, atoms are conserved. That is where we get the law of conservation of mass from. All right, this idea was developed by a um, chemistry teacher named John Dalton. I'll give you a little bit of background information on Dalton here uh, with a little story in just a bit. Um, I always think of Legos as similar to atoms 
And what I mean that by that is Legos can be built together, ripped apart, and rebuilt into new things. And you don't destroy Legos. In fact, if you've ever tried to destroy a Lego, they're pretty difficult, right? I mean, unless you take a blowtorch to them or a large hammer and smash them incredibly hard, Legos pretty much are indestructible. And atoms are kind of the same way. Atoms are basically indestructible. Unless you take an atom smasher or do a nuclear reaction, they basically stay the same. They don't change. So atoms can also be rearranged into different substances. Let's do a, a mental experiment here. I've got here a, a container, a thick walled glass container, and it has a mass of 300 grams. And in, inside here, I'm going to add 80 grams of oxygen and 5 grams of hydrogen. So I'm adding hydrogen and oxygen. And then I have some electrodes here where I can hit a switch to cause a spark. And let's see what happens. After I make my little spark happen, when I look inside, I no longer have any hydrogen. I still have 40 grams of oxygen. My container weighs 300 grams, so the total mass of this is still 385 grams. So how much water was produced? I'll give you a second to think about that. If you said 45 grams, you're correct. Do you see how if this weighs 385 grams, if the container still weighs 300 grams and you got 40 grams of oxygen left, this has to be 45 so that this adds up to 385. That's the law of conservation of mass. All right, Proust is, was an individual. Uh, let's look at his contribution to this. He said every compound has a specific ratio of elements and it's a ratio by mass. So water, every time you find it, has 8 grams of oxygen for every 1 gram of hydrogen. And there was, there's never an example of water that doesn't contain that. So he called this the law of definite proportions. Now, the law of multiple proportions is a little bit different. This one says Dalton could then use his theory to determine the elemental composition of compounds because he had no really reliable scale for atomic masses. Let's, let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Okay, So this Dalton's data then led him to a general statement known as the law of multiple proportions. That elements can combine, the same two elements can combine in more than one way, but the ratios of those masses of the second element to the first are always a whole number ratio. And again, what I mean by this is water is H2O. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. If you ignore the hydrogen, the two hydrogens on each, you're left with oxygen 1 and oxygen 2. So you end up with multiple proportions, but they're whole number ratios. Again, the main part of this is that these were ideas that supported the idea that atoms are indestructible and help us understand that atoms don't break apart in chemical reactions. They simply rearrange. Dalton stated that elements were made of atoms. Now, his model of the atom, now I, I, I'm going to put this in a time frame for you. Um, the Greeks were 2,000 years ago. Uh, when we looked at Robert Boyle, he was in the 16, late 1600s. When we go to Dalton, he's now in around 1800. Now, his model of the atom would be identical to the Greek model. It was a bowling ball, basically. It was solid, indivisible, had no protons, no neutrons, and no electrons. However, Dalton offered experimental evidence based on the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. And that's why one of the reasons Dalton is remembered today. We'll actually learn he did a lot with gas laws later on. He also called the elements pure substances because all atoms of an element were identical and that, in particular, they had the same mass. Now, it turns out we also don't agree with that idea. We're going to learn about isotopes. Maybe you remember these from biology where you have carbon-12 and carbon-13, and carbon-13 is radioactive and carbon-12 is not. 
and it turns out they differ by just a single neutron. Now, Dalton wasn't dumb. He didn't know of protons, neutrons, and electrons, so could not possibly have known of the idea of isotopes. Here's Dalton's atomic theory. All matter consists of tiny particles. He would have called these atoms, just like the Greeks. Atoms of one element can either be subdivided nor changed into atoms of another element. In other words, transmutation, changing carbon into mercury, would not be possible, he believed. Atoms can neither be created nor destroyed. All atoms of the same element are identical in mass, size, and other properties. Atoms of one element differ in mass and other properties from atoms of other elements. In other words, an atom of hydrogen, an atom of oxygen, and an atom of carbon are different. Right? And finally, in compounds, atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios. Now, without me talking about those, I think that many students would believe all of this is true. Right? We still believe that first item is true. The second one, we know that atoms can be broken up down into protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms can either be created or destroyed. We basically believe that. Uh, this one, number four, is nowadays we believe incorrect because we have the existence of isotopes. So, interesting where these theories come from. Okay, Here's Dalton in 1808. Now, he was uh, uh, a school teacher in England. He would have been one of those teachers where he taught all the subjects from young children to, you know, the high school senior, basically, right? And Dalton, in those days, was pretty sharp. He was, uh, do you remember from biology, doing Punnett squares, right? Gregory Mendel, Punnett squares, where you cross different plants and see what color you get? Well, he would have kids plant cross flowers and figure out, you know, what the offspring is going to be. Like, three out of four will be red, and one out of four might be yellow. Well, he was teaching Punnett squares and had the kids plant the flowers and looked at the data, and he realized that boys were just not very good at uh, this kind of work, and the girls were much better. And really what he had discovered, and he, he figured this out, was that the boys were not able to see the color of the flowers as good as the girls. And so he had discovered color blindness is more prevalent in males than females. Now, if you were to Google search color blindness, the medical condition is called Daltonism because John Dalton is the person that figured that out. He also uh, did a whole lot more uh, maybe in class I'll tell you some more stories about him personally. At this point, I don't want to waste your time because this video is already getting rather long. This is a page from Dalton's um, notebook, and here's one of the big things that he did differently. Now, some of these we might notice. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, right? zinc, iron, lead, silver, gold, platinum, mercury, potash. Well, that's not an element but we'll learn that that's potassium hydroxide and lime is calcium hydroxide. So even though he was identifying all these substances as elements, he didn't have them all correctly identified. And these numbers represent relative weights or what we would consider molar masses. Now again, they're not correct by our standards today, but it's a beginning point. Okay. And the other thing that I'm going to point out that he was, he's the first person to do, he gave each element a symbol, these little shapes, right? So if he wanted to write water, he would have combined hydrogen, this shape, with oxygen. Now, he wouldn't have known two hydrogens to one oxygen, but he would have known that water is a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. And it was later chemists that decided that if you instead use symbols like this, use letters to create and call elements, then you could actually publish books. And that was a big game changer when that was figured out. But Dalton did a lot, right? He came up with the idea of using symbols for elements and that atoms could be combined by combining, you know, to make compounds by simply putting them together. So he was a very important figure in early chemistry. So this is not necessarily the way that Dalton would have made carbon dioxide, 
but so that we understand it today, carbon would be the center black dot, and then two oxygens would represent the blue dot. That's how we would represent it, and so I'm not sure that would be very foreign to Dalton. He would have recognized that. If we want to do water, you know, nowadays using Dalton's models, we would have used right here one oxygen and two hydrogens, right? Again, he would have just had an oxygen and a hydrogen. He didn't know it was H2O, the formula. He knew the weight ratio, uh, though, instead. And this might be methane CH4, just to kind of show you how that might look uh, if Dalton were writing that out. Now, um, I wanted to go through, but I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail right now on, uh, on this video because I think it'll take too long. But if you, we, we could go all the way back to the 1830s to Michael Faraday where he separated water and did electrolysis experiments. And using these experiments, he figured out that matter had an electrical component. Okay? Now, that's going to be an important idea as we develop the model of the atom. And again, this is all after Dalton's work in you know, the early 1800s. Then there wasn't a lot of work happening, and then by 1895, this guy, Wilhelm Röntgen, discovers x-rays. And we're going to talk about cathode rays and, and all this stuff, and then um, how x-rays in radiation could be used to discover and elucidate the structure of the atom. Kind of like if I take an x-ray of my hand, I can see the bones and see if there's a breakage in my fingers. So I can use light, x-ray light, to see inside an object. And they thought, well, maybe you could use that to see inside atoms. And then we're going to go through all of these people. They're all very important people and talk about their contributions to science. But I, again, I'm not going to do that right now and bore you with those details right now. Um, I think what I'm going to do is stop this video and then I will start on this other part just so we don't get too bogged down on one big video. Alright, take care and I'll see you in just a bit.